Apparently Zoom thinks I'm dims today. This is, this is great. That's still flattering. Who are you? <laughs> uh, I am. I am Aaron of Sigbeard today. Ah, Sigbeard. No, I. I, did, I couldn't see you when you were speaking. Oh, all, all good. Sorry. Um, yeah. No. Zoom. Zoom gets really confused and thinks I'm either Aaron of Sig testing, Aaron of Sigbeard, Dims, Sig release, or uh, occasionally Sig contributor experience, depending on which meeting I'm currently signing into, which meeting I've signed into recently. It's it's nuts. And are you dialing in versus clicking the link? I'm always clicking the link. Zoom get I, I don't know. There's some seems to be some weird thing with like cookies or something. Definitely. I'm embarrassed to say that I went up to David Oppenheimer in Copenhagen and thought that he was Chase. And from the side, there's actually a really strong resemblance. He told me that I was not the first person. Yeah, um, that happens a couple times. <laughs> okay, and uh, Diego and Aaron, could you see if um, William will be able to attend? He had a proposal out that I was hoping we could decide on. Okay, it's five after. Um, shall we go ahead and get started? And we have the um, agenda doc that I will just um, drop into the Zoom chat here. Um, and I, I think the first uh, item was, uh, and um, Taylor's going to start typing in folks here, but uh, what was decided at the uh, KubeCon session in Seattle? Aaron, would you um, <laughs> want to do I, I actually put the agenda item in because uh, I'm sorry, y'all. Like, I've been talking a lot, but I kind of forget what we actually really well and truly decided. Uh, so, just scanning through the notes, I feel like we agreed that uh, conformance is non blocking for getting Windows to GA. Uh, okay. I feel like there was a lot of nodding of heads that we want conformance profiles to be additive only, but it's unclear to me whether we actually got into the finicky details of how we're going to implement that back to Windows. Um, so one of the uh, so th so there's that. Um, am I missing anything? So, so one of the things we looked at was calling certain things uh, validation suites, I believe, because then we would remove the confusion of, for now at least, we've got the conformance set, but this allowed everybody who had to build all the use, all the all the end-to-end -end tests that they needed, we were calling them validation suites. Um, I remember that being a big part, which, which really helped relieve the confusion of, listen, when we get to having a real profile, well, we'll know what a profile is. I mean, we can call it a profile. Maybe the Windows one day gets to profile. Brian, I know, mentioned, hey, we still got to figure a lot of stuff out here, but they can move forward. But the the calling the things validation suites really relieved a lot of the pressure. Because, uh, you know, if, until we have a good reason to have a quote-unquote conformance profile, you know, I tried to articulate that you know, if we ever do a, an on interoperability test with 15 vendors on stage and you got to make sure that the stuff works on all 15 vendors, trying to go through and, and, and deal with everyone having different subsets of profiles would really be hard. So strong agreement there. So the way this was phrased in the meeting notes is mm -hmm. that right now we have a set of tests that are called node conformance that are designed to exercise all of the behaviors we expect out of a node. And so the thinking was, let's rename node conformance to node validation. 
Yep. And so there is currently a directory called common. Sorry, I'm blanking a little bit here. There's a directory called node E2E. That's all of the tests that can only run on a node. So they require, they assume privileged access to the node to do a little bit more like white box testing of these behaviors. Um, and then there are a set of behaviors that can be tested uh, by way of conformance testing. So you want to exercise the same behavior both individually on the node as well as at the cluster level. Um, and so thinking was that Windows tests would go into a new directory called Windows and those would just be Windows only behaviors that are at the node level. Um, so the, the example that uh, we were using in SIG testing yesterday was to talk about file system permissions, for example. As a behavior, I think file system permissions are a pretty fundamental requirement of how Kubernetes operates. But as an implementation of that behavior, there's like a different string that you have to use for Linux versus Windows in terms of how you describe those permissions. So the hope would be that you have different implementations, but it's the same behavior, and that's split across two different node validation suites. Are we all getting vague nodding of heads? Are you the COSI, the container OS interface? Well, I think part of this, part of the issue is some of the tests were written in a fairly expedient manner depending on specific Linux utilities like LS, for example. Um, so it's clear that those just aren't going to port over and work in the same way. There are other such examples. Um, I agree that we're kind of lacking. We piggybacked so far on Linuxisms. Uh, and in general, we need to identify more of those both in the API and in lower level behaviors in the system. Uh, if we hope to abstract across multiple, multiple operating systems in any significant way. I think we're just at the earliest, earliest stages of that at the moment. Um, for now, I, Windows is one of many optional behaviors in the system. I don't want to overly fixate on just Windows um, since we have other issues like single node versus multi-node or GPUs or other things. Uh, so as we keep in mind, how do we support these optional non-portable environment specific or platform specific features? Uh, what is the right way to accommodate those? Like we don't have any significant persistent volume tests in the system because there's no uh, common persistent volume implementation uh, or conventions. So I actually think that one is way more critical in some sense to think about conformance wise. For Windows, I want I do want to un unblock them like any other optional features. They shouldn't be blocked by the lack of conformance tests. It is a good use case to keep in mind. It has some pretty significant implications across the system and we're still working through those. My priority right now is just to help them uh, meet the general expectations of an implementation of anything in the project. Um, so that's sort of where we are with Windows. I agree to reduce confusion with the node conformance test that renaming them validation makes a lot of sense just to reduce confusion. I'm not sure any specific decisions were made in the meeting and usually we try not to make decisions in in-person meetings when not everybody can be present, although we did have pretty good attendance. Um, That's but, kind of why I'm trying to get us to rehash some of these conversations here in a publicly recorded medium. Although that meeting was also recorded and is posted on YouTube, thanks to the wonderful efforts of the CNCF paying all of the recording staff for that. So uh, I, I feel like we're in agreement on those two goals that we want to unblock Windows. So Windows is not going to be necessarily part of the conformance discussion for at least this quarter. And there is a hope that somebody will work on untangling all of this by renaming node conformance to node validation.
just to speak a little bit to how tactically we're going to proceed with Windows if this is of some interest to this group. We have had a thread bouncing around between SIG architecture, I think this group, and I think SIG testing. So I finally said, look, Patrick, let's just, let's all get in a room and talk about this until we have agreement, at least from a SIG testing perspective, that we're going to allow for there to be a Linux only tag and a, and a SIG Windows tag to allow us to specify in stringly typed test metadata that is regexable, which tests are never going to work on Windows because they are Linux only, and which tests are never going to work on Windows because, uh, am I getting this right? Tests that never work on Windows because they're Linux only, tests that never work on Linux because they're SIG Windows tests. Um, and the goal would be to have SIG Windows drop in the Linux only tag in all of the tests that they're unable to get passing on their um, implementation of Kubernetes and then try to reduce as many uses of that tag as possible. Um, this tag being completely orthogonal to conformance and purely for informational purposes. Uh, and I linked the mailing list where we kind of summarized that discussion. Brian, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just want to clarify that on Tests that are just don't work yet on Windows, I don't think those should be tagged Linux only. Uh, I think only the tests that are inherently Linux only because they depend on specific Linux primitives and semantics and APIs should be tagged Linux only, like seccomp or Linux capabilities or SE Linux or App Armor or specific file system permissions or whatnot. Things that don't work yet on Windows, we need to tag a different way. And there may be some other categories of things like this, you know, we are tagging things that require privilege and no, Windows doesn't support privilege. It's just one example. Uh, so I'd rather be more specific about the reasons for why a test might or might not work in a different environment. So I just want to clarify that one point. We mentioned that on the call too. Yeah. There was the same concern, so. Yeah. yeah, I think one thing that we did discuss at the meeting, which uh, we do need a resolution to, and I don't know that we have one, is getting more, pe more feet on the ground to help with some of the work, like relabeling the node conformance test to node validation or to help improve the coverage in the areas that are prioritized. On the agenda, Brian. Oh, uh, okay. Well, if you look in the chat, Srini just volunteered for that. Just uh, so Oh, okay. so, I, hang on, I want to go back to what Brian just said to make sure I can, I can save Dear Patrick further work. Sounds like Brian is proposing that we use three tags, one called Linux only, one called Linuxism, and one called Windows only. Not exactly, but uh, sort of in that vein. Like just for the tests that don't happen to work on Windows, I want to tag those for the more specific functionality that they require. That, that's fair. I just like, as long as you think it's kosher for one SIG called SIG Windows to start adding a tag to all the tests that say like, these don't run on Windows yet. Um, we will we'll go do that. Uh, yeah, I mean, any, in general, anybody can, ta can tag tests as long as they get reviewed by subject matter experts. Okay, I was just trying to make sure we document the agreed upon set of tags, their meanings, and how and why they're applied, so. Um, so Dan is raising his hand, but I, I did want to clarify that we do need to resolve with SIG testing what the best, most ex appropriate mechanism for is for tagging the tests for different behaviors and environments. Right now, there's a really long explicit test list. Of, yeah, of I, that's, that's what I'm trying to say. Like, we, we agreed that two tags were fine from our perspective, if you're saying that's unacceptable from your perspective, A, I wish I had included you in that conversation, but B, I'm happy to take three tags back and drive that forward. Okay. So and if we just say tagging is the mechanism, I think that's a good starting point. Okay. Uh, Dan. So uh, agreeing with everything so far, and in particular, that there wasn't consensus in Seattle to move forward with um, uh, the Windows conforms program yet, but I, I think there was um, a particular eagerness from the SIG Windows folks to understand what the steps are 
to be able to have that profile. And so I was wondering if we are willing to fast forward a few months here and say, if all of those um, tags are done and there's a clear dashboard and all the Windows tests and all the whatever joint tests are all passing, um, whether what other things they need to do to, um, uh, to be able to go forward with conformance. So I think Brian's never bottomed out on the discussion about like where I am certainly comfortable with a cluster optionally having nodes which can meet the requirements of Windows only workloads. But the cluster itself being fundamentally different and behaving differently than Linux based clusters is one that has implications on workload portability and tools built on top and so on and so forth. And so I don't want to suggest that there even is definitely a series of steps which could align to Windows conformance without more conversation. We had one of the things that's written in our meeting notes from the session was that we had decided to think of Windows as an optional feature and conformance doesn't necessarily apply to optional features. It's there may be some mechanism where there's a badge. This cluster supports Windows workloads. This cluster supports GPU workloads. This cluster has lasers. Uh, that I, seems reasonable, but interacting with the Kubernetes API and some base level functionality that that API exposes ought to be universally a message to customers that they can expect the same behavior. So uh, if I can say, I think that in, in my mind, part of the confusion comes in is that because we're doing this bottom up, looking at existing tests. And, and I think I was just looking at what Srini put together on some tracking issues. And I think that when we put together the conformance criteria, they need to be distinct from the tests, right? And, and right now, I don't know, it seems like they're intermingled. So if we can define specifically each of the behaviors apart from the tests, um, then it becomes clear that whether a given cluster complies with that, even if you don't have tests, you can manually verify it, right? So um, obviously we wanna fill in tests to get full coverage, but um, I don't think tests and whether they're tagged with this or that are, uh, that bottom-up approach is the really easiest way to, to make it clear to everybody. Like if you had a list, if you had this report and you could say, I meet, must meet all these criteria. And I don't think it's quite that simple right now. Sure. I, I, I think the tests are a proxy for something else. Um, exactly. And that I agree with, but, and I think if we had a comprehensive exhaustive spec, of what it is to implement the Kubernetes API and what is required and what is optional, that it would be easy to start there and write the test suite. We don't have that today, so we're going the reverse direction. Right, but we've had the discussion of, of coverage and whether coverage is sufficient, and it's hard to know that without knowing that, that spec, first of all. And, and second of all, when you get into issues of, is this test should this test go towards conformance uh, for this particular platform? Um, I don't know, I think that not having agreed upon that spec ahead of time, it means we just argue a lot about it or, or people can't quite come to agreement. Discuss a lot. <laughs> Better so way. just to, to summarize there, what we talked about in Seattle was that the if we did do profiles, the initial profiles we would do would only be additive. So very specifically in the Windows context, it would not be possible to have a conformant Windows only uh, cluster. You would need at least two Linux nodes, and then you can add on Windows nodes um, on top of that. And so it, it sounds like we're the, the first step is for Windows validation or Windows conformance to mean something which is by having these tests identified and passing 
uh, and reliable and such. And then this group still hasn't reached consensus on, are we ready to have our first profile? I think we're uh, not yet ready. And the Windows folks had much more practical issues like um, some of the current conformance tests, they don't pass. So they wanted changing those tests is hard because it requires more approvals. So how could they make progress? And that involves things like forking the tests, the tagging mechanisms and so on. So those mechanical details are still getting worked out. Um, in terms of adding it as a profile, I think it is useful to consider Windows along with other profiles we might add and how those might be packaged and communicated to users. Um, but I, I don't want to just consider only Windows because I don't think that's going to be sufficient. I also don't think it's going to be very impactful because right now, no Kubernetes services and distribution support Windows. There are other features like persistent volumes that are much more widely used that would have more impact. So are like persistent volumes and GPUs, are, are like those good examples to exercise the machinery? I think single node is a good example because it's a niche, but maybe an important niche. And uh, persistent volumes because the impact is so, uh, so broad, it's such a heavily used feature. Um, and maybe load balance services would be good to include in that because it's something that most cloud-based services support, but not all distributions support it. I'll point out that single node is a special case because it's subtractive, where everything else we're talking about is additive. Kind of interesting. Well, uh. well so I never want to have a subtractive profile. So the thing to cons I think eventually we will s remove things from the current default base set of tests and add them as additive profiles. I don't think single node meets the bar for that right now, but it is useful to consider how we would do that for things like features that require uh, cluster level, node level or network level privilege, which is something we've talked about doing, or how we would handle um, other locked down environments, which people are more and more interested in for security. So Brian, um, I, I unfortunately missed the, the meeting in Seattle, but um, last I heard the discussion around profiles was to have a very, very small number of profiles. But based on what you're saying now, it sounds more like we would have a, a, ba a base uh, core functionality and then we'd have other segments of functionality like um, persistent volumes and uh, load balancer integration and whatever, Though that sounds like we're gonna get quite a few more than just you know two or three profiles. What major subsystems would we say are optional, I guess? So uh, this is where I say we need to think about how we bundle sets of features into profiles. I don't think it's the case that we wanna have 40 profiles. We might have 40 test tags, but this is where we can look at you know, what sets of features are distribution supporting? What sets of features do we think are broadly useful for running applications and ensuring application portability, which is the goal? And we can bundle that functionality into a, a profile or something like that. No, so you're saying cloud we, provider. I'm sorry, go ahead, John. Oh, I'm sorry. Just we're saying we would have another um, uh, sort of a, another level of hierarchy that would consist of the, the features or functions, and you could conform on individual features and functions, but profile-wise, we'd have one. You could validate individual features of functions, okay. but the conformance okay. program would not certify individual features. Got it, okay. So conformance versus validation. I think Jago had his hand up in yeah, there. So just, I think that I like the bundling together concept. So like a cloud provider profile might include yeah. multi-node and persistent volumes and load balancers. Yeah, that's one specific thing I've had in mind is looking at you know the cloud-based Kubernetes services and what features do most of them support, like dynamic volume provisioning, which Stateful Set uh, heavily depends on in practice. If that's commonly supported, or we believe it should be commonly supported, we would include that in sort of whatever we call it, like a common profile. So I've been thinking about it in terms of base, which is sort of the base minimum functionality you need, and then sort of a, 
uh, common, sort of like uh, Linux has the Linux standard base sort of thing. Um, so I don't, I don't know what I would call them yet, but definitely thinking in terms of bundles of broadly implemented and useful together functionality as opposed to individual feature vector. Brad? Yeah, I guess what I envisioned was, you know, for GPU, persistent volumes, um, and there was one other one that folks mentioned, that we would, would start driving to have a, the, the validation test suites for those. And then everybody's comfortable that, no, oh, we got a whole bunch of validation test suites. We really know what it means to be GPU and your GPU works or your persistent volume works um, or what have you. And then you, you would then have a process for potential promotion and sort of a, you know, a squashing of the commits if possible to then add those in where it made sense. Right. So at the end of the day, whatever I can do to end up with minimal number of profiles, the one that works for most cloud providers, what have you is probably going to be an aggregate of the base profile, possibly the GPU, possibly the persistent volume. And I think there's one other one y'all mentioned that made a lot of sense to me. Um, and then, so you would have that two stage process, get all those validation test suites going. And then when it's presented to the outside world, the quote unquote, whatever becomes the enterprise cloud provider conformance profile is, is all of those kind of put together. And that way, as an outsider, at least it's a, say a binary or a ternary choice, as opposed to looking at every cloud provider and which eight of the 12 they implemented. Did that thought process make any sense to anybody to help minimize the com confusion to our users or no? Yes. Hey, so I have a, a controversial idea. Um, I am physically and mentally incapable of thinking about profiles because I'm too tactically focused on what is it that we're supposed to do to adequately cover our base before we even get to profiles. And I would greatly appreciate those folks who care tremendously about profiles and additional extras to help out with um, improving the base. Otherwise, we're never going to get to a point where profiles even make sense. And I would like to applaud Patrick Lang and the folks who are pushing hard on Windows as people who are stepping up and showing up and helping us out there. Um, and I really just, uh, like, if you want to keep having these discussions about profiles and stuff, that's great. But I don't think I should be involved in them. Yeah. But, you know, I have Srini. So Srini should be on your list of people you're looking to um, to help you out, right? So. He's trying to pick up work as well, so. Yeah, I mean, uh, essentially, would it make sense that we do the validation suites and see how they go, and then if a lot of cloud providers are able to run all these validation suites, then we can combine them into something, call it a profile. Is that the work you were referring to, Aaron, or no? I, I mean, those to me sound an awful lot like let's write some end-to-end -end tests and then see if they work across all Kubernetes distributions and meet the requirements of conformance. And then if so, let's promote them to conformance. And that's, that's the work of like doing a, a base profile, right? That's correct. Yeah. Right. But, that, but, but just to be clear, is that when you say, hey, I'd rather have help on this other thing because it's the crawl step and you all are talking about the walk and run step. I want to make sure Srini is engaging you, Srini. Uh, Srini is engaging you, Aaron, and helping you on that base step that you just described. So you, so you're not, you know, you feel like you are getting some relief. Well, so I want to. I don't know if I'm jumping us too far ahead into the the point, the part of the working group session where I said, "Hey, everybody, I'm leading the 114 Kubernetes release this quarter. It's going to eat up a lot of my bandwidth, and I'm not going to be really available for this as much this quarter." that has happened. Um, mm -hmm. I really haven't had any time to shepherd any PRs. And so what I'm like, the very next step that I have taken is to take every issue that we labeled with area conformance and put it onto a project board that everybody has, uh, everybody on the conformance GitHub team has admin access to. So you can add other people if you want. And then everybody who's in the Kubernetes org, which is most of us, has right access to. So the next steps would be for us to 
think of that as a backlog of work and um, prioritize it and filter it to make sure that it's actually the scope of work that we collectively think drives us forward to adequate base coverage. Um, and so I think I'm talking about somebody doing that or a group of people doing that, getting consensus, and then actually shepherding the appropriate PRs. And even better, it'd be super awesome if people were writing end-to-end -end tests. I know we do have like a couple contractors, but it's, it's three people. Uh, Brian had his hand raised. Uh, speaking of project boards and project management and uh, shepherding, uh, I'd sent out some email uh, summarizing the priorities and the rationale for the priorities. And uh, there was a follow-up suggestion to convert that to issues or a project board or something. Has that been done? Anybody? I have personally not had the bandwidth to do this. <laughs> I think someone else might have volunteered. You're looking um, awkward silence. <laughs> I, I can help with a first pass cut and show you how we do it for Sig Cluster Lifecycle. I would say we're probably super regimented about how we approach the process, and it's uniform across our sub projects. And I'm happy to share how we do it. Um, uh, but you know, if it can't be a party of one. Tim, I wouldn't mind pairing with you on that and documenting it for, for this group. Okay, so like the, the, this is kind of my concern is that, um, thank you for stepping up Hippie and Hippie actually has a, a whole team of people. You might know him as the guy who wrote API Snoop, but like one of the options we have is to take him and his team of people and run them through the exercise of writing end to end tests and seeing how the, what the whole happy path for that process is, including using something like API Snoop to, to drive their decisions. But I feel like they're going to lack, the appropriate consensus from this group. Like I look at the discussion we just attempted to have on profiles. I asked us if we had made any decisions and I feel like we just went and revisited every single one and undecided them. <laughs> so I have concerns about how we're actually gonna get consensus from the appropriate group of people to push these things forward. And so any, somebody who's just like a regular old project manager, great, we would really appreciate your skills, but I have concerns you're gonna run into the same like circular discussion problem that we're running into right now uh, and that the global contractors run into, uh, which like I have tried to shepherd and push to help, but it's still like, it's this thing that we keep having to work through. So maybe I'm missing, uh, oh. okay, go ahead. Sorry, I was just gonna say, I think there are multiple tracks going on. One track is adding tests, which are obviously missing and promoting tests, which could be conformance tests, but just don't have the tag to becoming conformance tests. And folks in my group at Google have pushed that along significantly, writing a watch test, writing garbage collection tests, like writing stateful set and the workloads API tests. Like those are efforts that are uh, not contentious and are just work and we staff and move those things along quarter to quarter. Someone showed the number of conformance tests delta over time and that has grown. So I think there is a body of work of writing tests and promoting those that exist or breaking them into being more targeted tests so they don't test things by accident. There's another body of work that this group typically ends up being in discussion and debate, and it is difficult to come up with a path forward for profiles and what does it mean to different interested parties and are those interested parties even on the call? It doesn't look today like the Windows folks are on this call, so we had a conversation, but their voices that need to be part of that are not in this discussion. 
So that that is a circular ongoing discussion that will evolve slowly over time. But I don't think that means we're stuck on the entire effort. We can continue to make progress on pod conformance uh, by having people who write features for that part of the code base to also work on conformance tests. If I can say, I, I think there's a third thing, and I brought this up earlier. Maybe I'm maybe I'm the only one who thinks thinks we need we should do it this way. But um, the build like like I said, building the tests and tagging them as conformance is this bottom up approach. But I think that where we need to agree is on what you know what the the behaviors are, and that I think that that Srini did start. If you look at what was in the agenda to at least categorize, create these categories of, okay, we need conformance in this area, but what exactly that means, I don't know if, if I guess, how do we measure the coverage of whether those conformance tests actually cover the behaviors that we could want to consider as part of conformance? And uh, go ahead, Jago. Yeah, I was gonna say, I, I tried at the very beginning of this whole effort to go top down. Uh -huh. My process was go to the kubernetes.io landing page and what does kubernetes claim to be right and try to describe it in terms in very high level terms how do we, how can we guarantee that kubernetes platforms and distributions meet this claim uh, it was very very challenging the documentation is out of date or inconsistent uh, I can show that document again but I found that was not of super fruitful or actionable path forward. So, so what about at a more, uh, still a lower level, but like, so so we go through the, the if you look at say the pod API spec, right? You look at the spec of a, a pod, you can say, okay, this particular field, you know, can have these values. What, what does that mean? What is the behavior associated with that? And I think that that's a little, that's lower level than what you're talking about, but should be more concrete. And if it's poorly documented, then you know all the better if we can actually figure out how it, it should work and make sure that that we all agree and think it works the way it should work so i i encourage you to take a pass <laughs> okay. i will describe the moving the apply logic from the command line to the server side required multiple 40 page docs to even describe what it's supposed to do which is the first time that that had been done until then it was supposed to behave the way it behaved which is circular and not useful so I'm all in favor of what you're saying, but it requires that someone go and do that. Yeah. Aaron? So I, I walked through Srini's uh, spreadsheet and the issues linked therein, and I feel like a lot of them are placeholder issues. And my, my, um, my suggestion would be that we try and keep all of our work in the Kubernetes org one of the reasons I created the area conformance label was so that we could track this work on in any of the sundry repositories that the work actually happens inside of the Kubernetes org. So this means we can apply it to work that has to happen in documentation in K-community, in any test jobs that need to run, say, like the upstream conformance image because uh, the conformance program still uses, I think, a different conformance image. Uh, that's in test infra, and then all of the code that actually has to land in Kubernetes, Kubernetes. Uh, so if we're going to do like uh, tracking issues, I'd rather have them be somewhere in the Kubernetes org and that they have the area conformance label on them so that we can use the one board. And just to be clear, I created this one board as like the clearinghouse for everything, issues and PRs. This is kind of different from where like uh, Brian had Jace create a, a tracking board for SIG architecture to sign off on conformance tests. This was just to shepherd like one conformance test to another and maybe it's still good for that sort of shepherding process. But I, I've heard people repeatedly ask for like the one true backlog that has everything outstanding in it. And I feel like this is the best attempt at it. Um, it, it feels like it has a little bit more substance than the placeholder issues that uh, Srini created. Though I am open to somebody telling me that that's way too overwhelming and we should start fresh with a clean slate, but just then we have a, a, an end standard way of tracking all of our conformance work. So where is your board, Aaron? Uh, I linked it in the meeting notes. Uh, it's, I will paste a link to it in chat shortly. Okay. Um, 
It's in the What's Kubernetes. The it's called CNCF Kate's Conformance. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Andy. Uh, anyway, and I apologize if I'm like going off on a, on a rant here. This is really like, y'all, I want to help out as much as I can. But if you're wondering why nothing's happened, um, then I can tell you at least I haven't been pushing any balls forward. And I apologize for that. But if you want these things to progress, you need to help start pushing these things forward. Okay. So when you say forward, uh, is it most of the work done by the contractors or is, uh, is this individual six, uh, six are um, responsible for the backlog or the triage part? Yes. Okay. <laughs> like there's, there's a little bit of the contractors are gonna run into this and you're gonna have to help them through that. Uh, the contractors might just need some general help um, and maybe you have some more domain expertise than the contractors on things like how are we going to keep the docs up to date and, and some of the other PRs that you, Srini, have pushed forward in Kubernetes, Kubernetes. Yeah, I can definitely help with that. I mean, um, again, at the end of the day, we still have to have some kind of a mechanism to talk to individual six. Um, and we do not have um, a, a meeting set up with the contractors that, we, on a bi-weekly or weekly basis to discuss so, these things, right? So next step, I'm happy to do in the yeah, I'll punt over to Jacob. I'm happy to open that meeting up. Sounds good. Cool. Uh, I just wanted to check in on one of the mechanisms we put in to try and encourage growth of conformance tests over time was the gate that to to move from beta to stable API. It had to be a conformance test plan. Has that actually happened in practice? And is that a, a useful mechanism, Brian? So currently it is not very useful because uh, most features that are being added are optional in some way. So they're not currently falling under the base conformance profile. Okay, so it's all sort of the backlog of either already were stable or are too complicated to move from, from beta to stable. So one of the things I am trying to do as part of this release cycle is to encourage the Kubernetes community that everything that's landing, and by landing that means going from alpha to beta, beta to GA, or just landing as alpha outright, should have a thing called a CAP, the Kubernetes Enhancement Proposal, and part of the contents of that proposal should include a checklist of graduation criteria. And I am totally fine with SIG architecture saying that anything that's landing as stable should have conformance tests as part of that checklist. I feel like that's the appropriate mechanism to use for enforcement. SIG release and the release team won't like mandate this stuff, but if SIG architecture wants to say that has to be part of the content, we will gladly say your checkbox has not checked, you're not landing. Yeah, I agree that that's the right mechanism. It is documented as yeah. in the place where we currently document the criteria, but again, only for things where conformance is applicable. Um, so like if someone were adding a new RBAC feature, RBAC is not currently in conformance, so it wouldn't be caught by that. Uh, as part of SIG architecture, we are going to more generally enhance the documentation of the bar for different levels of maturity uh, for APIs and for other features and behaviors. Uh, so that's something on our slate right now. So right. just because you don't have conformance tests doesn't mean you shouldn't have any tests. Right, and to be clear, this is what brought us back to our whole rationale for saying that Windows support is an optional feature and conformance does not apply to optional features, which was what would allow Windows to go GA without having conformance. So we just have to write that down so we don't forget that. Right, which down? What did what he just said? Oh. It's written in the, the discussion down below. I feel like maybe that's actually the one thing we, we do agree on as a group today is that we're not going to consider, yeah, Windows going to GA does not require conformance. We agreed on it last year. Sounds like we still agree on that this year. Uh, we've tactically repeated that in a number of other recorded meetings, such as SIG architecture and SIG testing. 
um, and it will be written down in the CAP. Shall we move on to um, the proposal William made about being able to certify more than three versions back? Oh, would you like me to explain the reasoning on that? Was, is that not considered decided by email? Yeah, I thought that was done by email as well. Oh, so we had two proposals. Which one are you referring to, Dan? Was it the pull request? Uh, so, so yeah, so one, one proposal we accepted, which is that um, with 1.13 today, you're allowed to certify not just 1.13 and 1.12, but we added in the ability to certify 1.11. So that three version piece is accepted and I think a lot of people are appreciative of it. You had a separate proposal, right. which is essentially to say, as you certify, it, let's say a new vendor comes in and, and certifies 1.11, 1.12 and 1.13, your proposal would allow them to also certify 1.0, 1 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1 et cetera, um, to go further back. Yeah, well, okay, so firstly, thanks everyone for supporting the, the proposal that got approved. Uh, that went pretty well, I thought, and we already have a whole bunch of people uh, using it, so I think that's a success. Um, so regarding this other one, um, just to clarify, it's not really to go back to 1.0. Um, the, the, the main reason I proposed it, and I'm not really like very attached to it, so I'm happy to close it if, if you think it's a bad idea. Um, but so currently a provider is able to continue to offer an old version um, as certified Kubernetes, as long as they also offer the current version. However, a new participant to the program can't do that. So effectively that th this PR would basically just sort of level the playing field and let you know anyone say offer certified 1.10, provided they follow the existing rules that they also have to offer a current one defined as um, you know, the current version and the last two. So the, the main, the main thrust behind the proposal is just to level that playing field so that everyone can offer the same versions. Whereas right now, if you didn't kind of get in at, at you know, when you could, then you sort of, you can never offer that one, whereas someone else can. Does that make sense for starters? I, so I guess I'm a little confused because you can, given the first proposal that was agreed on, you can, if you came in today, 113 is out, you can certify 113. Yep. 112 is available and supported by the community. You can certify 112. 111 is out and still within the mm -hmm. range, so you can certify 112 and 111. Are you suggesting right. that the playing field is not level because we can't also go back to 110? So. Currently, someone that had a 110 certification gets to keep that. They can still offer certified 1.10. What, what we said in the terms is you can do that, but only if you also offer like a current one alongside it. So as long as they're offering 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, as long as they're offering one of those that is sort of current, they can continue to offer their, their previous you know 1.10 as certified mm -hmm. communities. So um, coming out of the... LTS discussion, maybe we extend to four in the future to get a year worth of support. But today, 110 is not supported by the community. So any vulnerability would not be patched on that version. There's no community support for it. So I'm really uncomfortable allowing a newcomer to go back and certify an unsupported version of Kubernetes. So maybe we need to revisit that role because like, currently you can still offer 1.10s as certified Kubernetes as long as you certified it while it was current and you still offer a current one. So we're actually allowing that today. So maybe maybe the, the result is could be actually revisiting that. What, what counts as a current one right now? Uh, one of the last three. So, so one, 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 three, one, twelve. Uh, supported today. <laughs> And as soon as 114 is cut, then we drop 111. Right. But the people who, who certified 111 in this current period get to, get to use it forever, as long as they're still current. Uh, so William, do they, do they have to run <clears throat> the older test now or just keep whatever they filed before? 
So currently they get to keep whatever they filed before. And that's the only way to, to do that. Right. So if it, if it, things were a bit rotten, they are not able to run the tests anymore. We don't force them to run the test. Not on that old version. We do force them to have a current version also conformant. But the tests are versioned with the minor release of Kubernetes, so the test should still run. Theoretically, yes. And it, yes, and in fact, that's quite important because people should have done like that, I guess. Yeah, that's the problem. I don't, I don't know if we, we can go... If, a, if somebody comes new to the, uh, to the ecosystem and they want to run 1.9 conformance tests, I don't know if they are able to do that right now. Yeah, Dan has his hand up. Uh, just on a practical level, I, I want to point out that there's very few companies who have the level of investment that they can credibly um, maintain an old version, security fixes on an old version of Kubernetes. And I, I think we acknowledge that Red Hat has that business model and, and um, several other companies. Uh, a, a decade ago, we would have ironically said, yeah, but what if Microsoft comes in and they suddenly want... But uh, I'll actually use the example of Ericsson, where um, they're not yet certified. I, I certainly expect them to be soon. Um, I think it's a very different message to say, hey, come in, you can have 111, 112, 113. And then if your engineers get up to speed and you want to claim to your customers that you're understanding every security patch that's made and maintaining that going forward on 111, that still seems to me like a very different story than them saying, oh yeah, we've had this 1.7 version out there and we want to certify that as well. And so I guess if somebody asks for it with a really specific reason on why they need to go backwards, yeah. I think we could always reconsider it, but I would suggest that we table this for now. I feel like the proposal we did include already incorporates, so it relieves a lot of the pressure of folks who are feeling like it was yeah, too fast to recycle. cycle. I'm happy with that outcome. Um, let me just give you a concrete example. So Google is currently offering 1.10 in production. Um, you know, presumably with all the bug fixes and security patches applied. Um, and that is certified 1.10 and we can continue to offer certified 1.10 for as long as we want. Um, someone else like Ericsson cannot do that. So there is a little bit of a, yeah, you, you have to have been there, I guess, when that version was current in order to, to have that certification mark on it. Um, so it wouldn't be able to do that now. Um, that was the reason behind the PR, just to kind of equalize that opportunity. But yeah, I'm happy to table it. You know, I don't have a, like I said at the beginning, I'm not strongly attached to it. I, I kind of feel like Ericsson not having users on 110 is an advantage over Google having users on 110. So I, I see it as an unfair playing field, but not in the same way you do. Yep. All right. I'll, um, I'll close it off. But I hope at least that made sense, like why it existed. Yeah, I kind of agree with the earlier statement that uh, the LTS discussions about patching maybe one more release back so there are a year of patched versions is probably the better way to address this. Right. And I, I mean, on principle, it, it would be natural for the things that you could certify to match the LTS, to match the security um, supported distributions. And so I, I don't think there's any unwillingness in this group to change those rules again if LTS uh, changes its policy. Just to be clear, you kind of triggered me when you used the word LTS as if it's a thing that exists. It, it's, it's our it, 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 there documented is an LTS. policy, right? So our documented support policy, which you can see if you go to the Kubernetes IO website and, and search for version support policy, lays out how many versions of Kubernetes we support with security fixes. There is no such thing as LTS. Though there is a very motivated group of people talking about it and whether or not it should be a thing and what LTS even means. But right now we just have a support policy. And, and out of that yeah. conversation came the discussion about should we extend for one more quarter, even without saying we'll support it for multiple years and yada yada, what does LTS really mean? The very simple concept was extend by one more quarter or one more minor release to get a full year. Yeah, I think in practice we patched uh, an older release uh, at least twice. 
an older release than we officially supported at least twice. We so. discussed this a bunch in SIG release where the CI infrastructure to allow us to patch four releases back, which is outside the window of three releases back, exists for like the first four to five weeks of the release cycle, just purely out of happenstance. No other reason than that. And if that's something we need to formalize or extend all the way to four procedures back, I would hope that that's being discussed at SIG release. Because we just had an in-depth discussion about like, well, maybe we'll make an exception in this one case where A, we happen to have the infrastructure around, so it's early enough in the cycle that we can do that, and B, it's because we are undoing a regression that the prior patch release introduced. Agreed. SIG release is the right place to have that discussion. Um, a very useful meeting. We'll reconvene in a month as long as there's any agenda items. And um, definitely sounds like there's a eagerness from Aaron for help on that project board. And so if any folks can find uh, resources to, they could offer on the mailing list, I think it'd be greatly appreciated. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. 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 Bye. 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 Thank mm -hmm. you.